In the heart of Rome, the Colosseum, the Forum, and the Arch of Titus remain witness to earlier Italian civilizations. One little-known chapter in the history of Italy is that of the 2,000 years of continuing Jewish communal life. In the ancient city of Ostia Antica, Rome's principal seaport at that time, pillars of a recently excavated synagogue stand as silent reminders of the origin of this history. They also stand in contrast to a more recent time in Italy's Jewish experience. Fifty years ago, during World War II, when descendants of these and other Jewish communities who sought refuge in Italy faced the terror and the consequences of the Holocaust. In October 1994, Wreaths were placed in Rome to honor the memory of the 7,500 Italian Jews who fell victim to the Holocaust, which had been set in motion in Italy in 1922 as a result of the ambitions of Benito Mussolini and his dream of a fascist empire. Until the passage of the racial laws in 1938, Mussolini frequently stated that anti-Semitism, which was not a significant factor among the Italian people, would not be evidenced as long as the Jewish community allied itself with the philosophy of his fascist government. However, along with most Italians, the 47,000 assimilated Jews watched with increasing alarm the build-up and deployment of his military forces during the 1930s. In 1938, Mussolini took Italy into a military alliance with Nazi Germany and adopted the Nazi credo of anti-Semitism. As a direct result of this alliance, the Italian government quickly approved the adoption of the infamous racial laws which stripped Italian Jews of their professions, their opportunities for education, and soon their freedom. By 1940, Italy, allied with Nazi Germany, was at war. Three years later, Allied forces turned the tide of battle, and from North African bases began the invasion of Italy, which resulted in the immediate downfall of Mussolini. By 10, 1943, Allied troops landed on the beaches of Sicily. With this first penetration of Italian home territory, the king has accepted the resignation of His Excellency Benito Mussolini and has nominated head of the government, prime minister, and Secretary of State, His Excellency the Chief of Staff, Marshal Badoglio. During the 45 days of the Badoglio government, Italian Jews waited in vain for the government to rescind the infamous and largely unpopular racial laws. While guns of the Allied Fifth Army pound Nazi lines in Italy, Allied planes continue to blast the enemy from the air. On September 8, 1943, Italy formally surrendered to the Allies. Headlines bring the people of the United Nations the most sensational news of the war, the surrender of Italy. The German army quickly began its occupation of those northern and central parts of Italy, which had not yet fallen to Allied troops. Mussolini was quickly brought back from prison by Hitler and installed as the head of the new Italian fascist government which was based in Salò, a northern Italian city. This new government quickly declared that Jews were the enemies of Italy. They were to be captured and placed in concentration camps from which they were then to be deported to Auschwitz and other German killing centers. For the Jews living in Rome, the Holocaust began on October 16, 1943. More than 1,200 men, women and children were captured on that day by German troops. During the following two years, nearly 6,000 other Jews were captured and deported. But remarkably, 
30,000 Jews, close to 80% of the Jewish population in Italy at that time, managed to evade the Germans and their Italian fascist partners thanks to the help they received from many thousands of fellow Italians. Near the Jewish ghetto in Rome, convents provided safety for many. It was an awful night in November. It was raining. One of those storms that you see sometimes in the month of November. At about nine in the evening, we heard some knocking at the door. The mother superior had instructed us that no one should answer the door, given the circumstances with the Germans. She personally went to answer the door. They came in and she asked, what can I do for you? It was a woman, her three-year-old daughter in her arms, and her husband. They said, we escaped from Rome, we are Jewish. The Germans are searching for us. Let us come in, otherwise we risk being executed. The mother superior answered, but do you know what we risk? There is a law, a decree. We also risk being executed if we help you. I know, we know, but please have mercy on the child we are holding in our arms. Let us in, don't send us away. So the mother superior replied, you are welcome, and so we shall follow your fate. 4,000 Jews found refuge in convents and monasteries in Rome. One morning we heard someone calling at the front gate, so we went down to see what was happening. The mother superior went down and found several Jewish families begging to be let in, even if just for a few minutes, as they were afraid the Germans would capture them. Naturally, we let them in. We opened the gate and they came in. We welcomed them in a spirit of fraternity, first because they were Jews and our religious order is founded on love for the Jewish people. Under those circumstances, anyone would have helped. One should help those in need, those who are being persecuted. Even if you are not a religious person, you would do it anyway. All you need is to be Christian, to have a little compassion, a little humanity. Assisi, home of the Shrine of St. Francis, offered its own refuge. Assisi fu proclamata città ospedaliera. Assisi was proclaimed a hospital city, which not only saved the city, but also the many Jews who had taken refuge in it. Naturally, at the time, I was not taking written notes, but I can confirm that at least 300 Jews came through Assisi. During the war, the Bishop of Assisi was Monsignor Placido Nicolini. This was the central point for assistance, not only for the war refugees who were numerous in Assisi, but it was especially a center for assistance to Jewish refugees. I was summoned by him one day in September 1943. He showed me a letter from the Secretary of State of the Vatican instructing us to give all possible assistance to those who were being persecuted, especially the Jews. We not only placed them with false identification papers in convents, but also in private houses and in hotels. I had one family in my house. There were moments of terror, like when the police came to my house to take me for questioning. So I quickly shut the door to the study and left with the police so that they did not find them. This family then went to seek help from the bishop, and he told them, as you can see, my house is full of refugees, but I still have my bed and my study. From now on, I can sleep in my study on the couch, and you can take my bedroom. Una 
We were able to get the false identification papers with help from a small print shop that prepared identity cards. We gave the Jews typical family names from southern Italy, which was the part of Italy that had already been liberated by the Allies. This way, the police could not cross-check the names. The biggest problem we had was to reproduce the German stamps. In fact, after several failed attempts to do so in nearby cities, we were able to do the job in our own St. Quirico monastery, thanks to some very skilled young Jews and two high ranking Italian army officers who also had taken refuge there. Then later, thanks to some friends in the city government office, we were able to get our hands on several blank original IDs that just needed to be filled out. Once the Jews had these IDs, they were safe and could legally obtain food vouchers. The most dangerous people were the so-called Nazi fascists, those Italians who sympathized with the Salu Republic. Assisi was teeming with fascist spies, citizens of Assisi who were collaborating with the fascist secret police. It was not only the clergy who helped. In the city of Magenta near Milan, Jewish owners of a small factory asked their plant manager for a place to hide. After giving the problem of where to hide them some thought, my husband and brother-in-law decided to take them to our friend's little house in the country. The Moko family agreed to go there. So traveling at night through snow-covered fields, they got to the house and stayed there a couple months. Then, naturally, the village people started to talk, saying that we were hiding refugees. We all got scared, so we came back and built this hidden bunker. From this discussion, we thought to recover a place that could be easily provided by a toilet. They thought of dividing this big storage place by building a wall and that the hiding place could be easily hooked up with water and drainage. The smoke from the little stove would go up over the courtyard of the convent next door, a place that was not very noticeable. They covered this wall with boxes. Factories needed to store great numbers of boxes. Someone looking at it would assume that the boxes were stacked row after row all the way back. and would not realize the place had been divided by the wall. The wall was here. You can still see the mark what it was. It has since been demolished to better use the space. My family and I lived in this room from the end of February 1944. I don't remember the exact date. Uh, to the 28th of April 1945. A total of 14 months. We did it because we were very close friends with this family. We had known them for years, my aunt especially. But all of us worked in the plant and we were very close friends. We did not worry about the danger. We did what we knew needed to be done, without question. 